Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. The world of crypto and blockchain is exploding. It's attracting an enormous amount of money, talent, resources, and obviously cowboys, scams, and Ponzi schemes. So what should we know in the regeneration world, in the finance world about this fascinating, scary, and very confusing world? Join me today in an episode where we scratch the surface, but hopefully give you some framework, some questions to ask, some metrics to dig into, to make sense of this as I said, very exciting, but also a very confusing world. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits, and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash egg or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to another episode. Today, I'm very excited to unpack blockchains, cryptos, online communities, community currencies, and so much more with Gustav, who has been working in the field for the last five years as a founder on the investing side and also on the impact side. So welcome, Gustav. Thank you, Carl. Nice to be here. Can you just explain, first of all, how you got into the crypto world and then also where your interest in like, let's say, a healthy planet or soil comes from? Because you're definitely not a farmer or a soil expert, but you are very interested in this space. I'm interested in both, let's say, journeys. How did you get into the crypto world? And then we'll unpack the other side. Yeah, sure. So uh, I was a student in Copenhagen. I had a very, very bad uh, concussion. We are back in like 2015. And uh, cannot do too much. So I'm really just uh, excited about uh, this new thing I learned about, which was called Ethereum at the time, which was uh, like a new blockchain. And uh, via this, I started going to a meetup in uh, Copenhagen. And uh, via this meetup, I was invited to join the first uh, European uh, blockchain summer school, uh, which was also in Copenhagen, where I was living at the time, at the IT University where we had different kind of case companies uh, and the Danish tax authorities and the banks and Mask, the biggest like uh, shipping company in the world. And we did some case studies there. And, and after this, uh, after this kind of few days, I was uh, sort of lucky enough to, to get some job offers uh, from different organizations. And I took one, which was sort of the most nerdy one, which was a German development studio uh, in Germany. And, and at that time they, uh, they had helped sort of as core developers to build Ethereum, uh, which is today the, yeah, the second biggest blockchain. And that's sort of what I found very interesting. I was interested before a bit because I played a lot of computer and all that stuff in like Bitcoin, but I didn't see too much the use case other than this kind of store value, digital money uh, aspect. But what Ethereum was at that time uh, and still is, is uh, a generalized uh, computer. So basically taking some of the, the basic ideas around decentralization that Bitcoin has done. But instead of only being a payment network, also sort of utilizing that as sort of a decentralized computer where you can put programs on. And I had studied the, on my bachelor of political science and on my master a bit more uh, sort of on the business side from the business school. And I just saw that, whoa, with these things, you can really address some of the sort of coordination, governance, funding issues that uh, in, you know, in various literature has been sort of something that we, we kind of spend a lot of time on. Um, so, so yeah. And then I got into space. I worked there a few years um, at, at that company in Germany, and uh, then eventually moved on to start uh, a company myself with some other guys and developers in America. And uh, yeah, since then, created other stuff. I, I created the Community Currency Alliance, uh, which was sort of more on the yeah, you know community local local currency field. And that's because the first project that I sort of led in that space was sort of mixing cryptocurrencies and community currencies. And uh, yeah, since then. 
just been very active in the space, investing. Now I work at, a, at what you can call a third generation blockchain, uh, what's called NIR, which is sort of taking the same approach as Ethereum, generalized computer, but trying to make up for some of the sort of shortcomings there around, you know, uh, the energy footprint and the transaction cost and some other stuff around user and developer experience. Um, and yeah, now I'm just uh, working there and, and engaged in, in this space and in various, various fields, also in some of the the early sort of DAOs, and DAO it's kind of funny, funny word, it means decentralized autonomous organization, which is not really fitting, I think, because it is sort of just, you know, you can imagine like kind of having a Facebook group, but not really controlled by Facebook, it cannot really be shut down, and then having other, these other things that blockchain offers, like specific voting systems, funding system, et cetera, et cetera, but basically just operating sort of a Facebook group, so then the, the, the DAO sort of choose how they, you know, vote, uh, select specific things, Etc. Etc. Uh, yeah. So that's more or less it. And and on the other topic. So, I mean, I've I've uh, as so many other people who've been in this podcast and, and in this world, uh, seen what we as a species are doing. Uh, humans uh, destroying destroying the planet, uh, destroying sometimes ourselves as well. Uh, and uh, I think it was really when I met uh, Bella uh, from Mustard Seed in, in Switzerland um, some years ago which I know you also know, that I really sort of got, got deeper into it uh, on, a, on a conscious level. And uh, via Bella got engaged with some of the projects that, that this charity Master Seed is also supporting. I think some of them have been on this podcast as well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but uh, but I will, I will not in any way say that like in the impact retail space, I'm, I'm just learning and I'm, I'm probably sort of what I can bring to this podcast is probably more on the crypto uh, side um, than sort of what some of the other experts in, in the region is also impact can, can yeah thank you so much for that intro definitely a shout out to bella i will put a link below for anybody that doesn't know bella had funny uh, his amazing history and the, the master c trust that he is running that actually also supported this podcast so and we met actually through them and there's so much to unpack there but let's start with you you mentioned a, a few things but one i really want to focus on for a second third generation blockchains that suggests there are two uh, before that and what's the advantage of let's say let's walk us through the first, the second, and the third, and why the third is so so important, especially I think many people have an immediate reaction to blockchain. Oh, they're so energy pollutant. They're extremely polluting in general. You already mentioned that that's been not taken care of, but being worked on. But why is that third generation so different than let's say the one and the second? What happened back in 2008? Of course, there was a financial crisis, but there was also suddenly this weird person appearing or group of people appearing, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, which sort of put Bitcoin live. And as you can imagine, it's it's a few years ago, but you know, this is the first time ever we saw this technology uh, in the world. And this was sort of Bitcoin and, and the first generation blockchains. Uh, I think you can think about that. That's at least how I view it. Uh, some, some people disagree that, you know, when I talk with Bella, for example, around the first computers he, he worked in, you know, which was like the size of a farm, or it's not a big house, you know, that's how I view Bitcoin, you know. This was the first time the, the technology came out, the first instance. And this was in itself a, a, like a breakthrough technology, which have created this new paradigm we're in, uh, which we can call the Web3, where blockchain is sort of one of those ledger technologies uh, combined with other sort of technologies. Um, but that also means that, you know, it, I'm sitting at a MacBook right now, right? There's a big, big difference between <laughs> sort of, the first uh, computers you see, you see at a, a museum and then a MacBook or let's say an iPhone with an app store in, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that use case of Bitcoin is really to solve what's called the double spending problem. Meaning that before on, on digital currencies uh, that had been sort of before Bitcoin, you would maybe have these digital currency systems, but there were always some kind of trust level involved. Basically what we want to have with this type of payment system is we want to have you know, a guarantee that I'm not sending the same money that I'm sending to you to, you know, your friend as well, because then that undermines the whole money system. So that's sort of what. Yeah. And instead of having a sort of a, a central database that keeps track of that, a, AKA a central bank, this was fixed with a distributed ledger and all kinds of level of trust without having one person or one organization to trust. Like this was distributed trust, but in a currency. Exactly, yeah. You can think about it as uh, computers around the world. They're all running some, some client uh, software. And what that basically does is that they have the same view on some accounting ledger. It's not much more complicated than that, to be honest. And that's sort of that use case that now we, we know, ver verified by all these computers and network, that there's not one line, et cetera. It also, where mining comes into the, 
the Pixia and all this sort of uh, sort of this energy war they running against each other. Uh, so that that's basically that. Um, with with Ethereum, as I briefly mentioned, and there was sort of of course other in between, but to me that's sort of the, the sort of the, the milestone for the for the second generation blockchains, and that that's the field I've worked in also a couple of years. Um, they basically said, you know, why not turn this power of these uh, computers around the world to create sort of a decentralized computer, so that it's not only a simple payment use case, but you know, you can deploy a sort of an organization on this. You can deploy a decentralized exchange. You can deploy, you know, a carbon credit app uh, as well, and it's maintained by the same sort of security guarantee, censorship resistant, and and trustlessness as, as you mentioned. So this is sort of the step into uh, Ethereum, and, and Ethereum today is also super, super successful. What has then happened to, to Ethereum is that it sort of got too popular in a way, so that you have a lot of uh, costs if you are sort of doing uh, on-chain transactions. Sometimes you, you need to spend several hundred dollars to, to do specific type of uh, interactions on, on Ethereum, and this is just not sustainable, of course. Uh, they're only, still only kind of limited million number of users today of Ethereum. So for this really to scale uh, large scale, uh, that's maybe not, you know, <laughs> that is not uh, great enough. Um, so, uh, and, and they are in the Ethereum space, there are a lot of kind of approaches where you take some of the things off chain and you use other primitives. That's what we call sort of layer, layer two. Layer one, when we refer to that, is always kind of the core blockchain. Then you have layer two, which is things that sort of are off chain, but maybe have some uh, component on chain that's kind of scalability solution for ethereum then you also have has what i would say sort of call uh, generation three blockchains and there they have a uh, look at uh, ethereum which right now is also using mining and also is is, is maybe a, a bit more energy efficient than than a bitcoin but but not really a lot uh, and that's because it still uses this what's called proof of work. And every time we hear proof of work, this is sort of related to the to the mining. Meaning mining simply meaning many computers running. Like you have to imagine again, like a farm size or more of servers running 24 seven using electricity, obviously in places where it's cheap. So mining in this case is a lot of computers, but go on Google if you're interested or YouTube and find some videos of this. This is our massive, massive farms, literally farming these these blockchains and that's proof of work. And we've been talking a long time about proof of stake for Ethereum to go to a more efficient way of doing that. Is that any way where near, like would they sort of, would then Ethereum become also the third generation or would they be stuck in 2.5? What is your view there? To me, it looks like it's on the way well for becoming what we can call a true third generation blockchain. The thing is that Imagine if you have a system right now with Ethereum, and I don't know the exact numbers right now, but let's say $400 billion, maybe it's Ethereum worth right now. It's not something you just migrate. Yeah, just for people to understand, like there are hundreds of billions of dollars, real money going through the different blockchains. Of course, mostly in the larger ones, but this is a space where a lot is happening. A lot of money is going around. A lot of infrastructure costs are being paid. A lot of people are putting serious money into these farms as well. And there's a lot of space for, let's say, for experimentation. There's a lot of money around looking for, to build new things, to develop things, to, of course, risk-wise, it's enormous because we're in the, in the super, super, super early stage. But definitely from an evolution point of view or experimentation point of view, we're in a very interesting phase of the whole evolution. And if you're saying Ethereum, like 400 billion, just to, for people, that's a four with 11 zeros, just to understand, yeah. Yeah, and I would say, yes, they are full on the way, and I believe they are They are sort of three steps defined. So what Ethereum basically is doing is that they are sort of creating a parallel chain, which is called the beacon chain, and they are slowly transitioning everything on Ethereum to that thing, and that thing is running on proof of stake. Uh, but it's sort of a step to go there, so there is no uh, mistake made on the way, because there are a lot of, you know, hackers or people trying to exploit whatever they can find uh, to, you know, extract this money. So that's why it's, it's probably a bit harder process for Ethereum to migrate because they have a live system. Whereas what what uh, other third generation blockchain have done is sort of started this network from the beginning. From zero. Yeah, yeah exactly. And they looked at Ethereum. They maybe wanted maybe build an app on Ethereum. They thought it's not really possible. It's too expensive. Or it's too slow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe there are other usability things as well uh, from from the from the developer side or the user side that would maybe do better. And then they have sort of you know did that from scratch from scratch on and and the uh, yeah, so most of those are running different versions then of proof of, proof of stake uh, protocols. When we say proof of stake in opposed to uh, to mining, where mining is this, as you say, like kind of 
computing game where whatever computer can first like solve a very complicated mathematical problem and they get a reward and that's sort of how the protocol is structured that's that's how someone is in the sort of uh bitcoin network competing to uh serve you by uh, processing your transaction and whoever can do this fastest uh will get it and uh, whoever can do it fastest is typically the people with the you know best hardware and and that's why it started with like something you could do on, on, a, on a very bad laptop and now as you say it's this competition has has gone sort of so far that it's now these big data centers and and i mean i, I don't know those exact numbers if it's we talk about energy consumptions of, of countries or whatever it's, it's always debated but it's it's definitely a lot of energy that's spent there which is kind of ridiculous in in my opinion uh, so proof of stake then means that and there are different variations here but you could kind of say okay a cone so you you would like to stay here so maybe you put a uh, X amount of tokens, uh, let's say on near, for example, where I work, you put X amount of near. If you are behaving well and just running like a normal kind of cloud server, so not, not all this extra energy efficient, uh, sorry, inefficient stuff, then you're going to get a reward. However, if we catch you trying to, you know, uh, do some malicious transaction or try to game the network, then you're going to lose your stake. This is basically the, the kind of the the logic behind this uh, consensus algorithm so it's only holding my tokens and not i don't have to create them or i don't have to mine them to with a lot of a lot of energy to prove that i have them no i i put them in a sort of holding or i put them in an escrow and then i have to behave well and if i do that i'm fine and if i don't I lose my stake yeah exactly and that's then the when you look at these networks there are people sitting and, and designing these things and they look at them so what's your cost? Okay, so you could try to do a malicious attack once. Cool, you lose all your money. You can try again, you lose all your money again. At some point, it's maybe not going to be worth it for you to try to, to game the system. There are also other protocols where if someone can point out that Cone is doing this, then that person maybe get a, a large amount of the of the, the coins that you know are slashed from you to incentivize people call like whistleblowing as well. So that that's how these sort of incentives in these uh, consensus algorithms are trust is built yeah. Uh, yeah exactly so that's the basic uh, design principle there often is you know to have this distributed network where people don't know or or, or like necessarily trust each other but they, they follow the same protocol where these incentives are sort of baked in and uh allegedly then uh, being you know uh, secure you see sometimes blockchains that are not as secure as they, they thought it would be so you know obviously uh when we talk about like trustless systems i think you know that's kind of design criteria, but but uh, I certainly don't understand how most of this stuff works myself, right? So uh, I have people that I trust that say they they, they you know fully understand it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I I think it's always going to be trust, in my opinion. I think trust is sort of fundamental for human beings. So I'm not in that kind of school where I think like uh, you know it's no trust at all. But the the system itself should be minimalized as much as possible. And as the software is open source, you could you could say sort of well. Uh, Maybe not everyone in the world can have the ability to go and, and look at the code and understand it themselves, but knowing that everyone in the world have the option to do that and everything sort of on the table is very different than, say, Corn, I would like now to, to you know, uh, have a balance in the interbank market and see the balance of all banks. This is just not public information. So bringing all of this stuff to the public domain and using open source software that everyone can verify, I think that also helps a lot sort of on the, on the trust side to to catch errors or to like see, okay, uh, we don't just have to take your word for it. We actually have ways to try to verify ourselves. Yeah, you have skin in the game. And so this sounds extremely interesting, but also relatively, I would say, quote unquote, far away from the physical world. But I know there are a lot of points where it touches the physical world or where you see in the near future it will touch. So let's go over a few of those where let's say you get excited, where it could touch the ways of how to create, let's say, a healthy, a healthy planet. And what you think that the audience, in this case, it might be experts on this or not at all, should really know about what is coming or what is already there. What are some, you mentioned DAOs at the beginning. Let's unpack those maybe a bit or some other funding models. Like how does it touch the world of farm, soil, trees, etc. And what we should know about this. Yeah, so we have this type of different like primitives or tools that is increasingly become much more available for everyone in the world. And one day is DAO. And when we say DAO, this is just yeah, this type of organization. I'm, for example, part of VC Investment Fund, and we operate as a DAO. And this means that we have pulled our money money together into a, a smart contract. A smart contract is then a small program we have put, in this case, on the Ethereum blockchain. And then 
we can collaboratively make decisions. Why did you choose Ethereum in this case? As you say, the transaction fees or the, like you, you need a lot to do transactions or was it the easiest option because it's the most widely used uh, smart contract uh, blockchain? Yeah, I would say at that time there was, uh, there was not really third generation blockchains alive like two years ago. And at the same time, maybe it's okay for us to pay 50 or hundred dollars to make transactions when we do like larger investments. Whereas it's maybe not okay to a cup of coffee. So it depends a bit on, yeah, on the specific use case. The use case, of course. Yeah. And so this is an investment fund. So you pulled money like many people might know in, let's say the Silicon Valley way or others, you pulled money from a lot of people. In this case, not necessarily accredited investors. They could be anywhere in the world. They pulled their current, their virtual currencies, obviously in one smart contract and then and then what happened? Like you don't have a fund manager, right? Like one person that sits on the, what is it, Mountain View or whatever in, in Silicon Valley deciding what to do with this? How is this different? In our case, we don't have it. Other investment DAOs might have it. That depends on everything, you know, on the legal setup they have chosen, etc. We are sort of more an investment club, as you may. So there, what we do is that we issue sort of new shares every quarter. And based on this, we are using different systems to sort of internally assess who have added value this quarter and those people then get a uh, higher they get you know uh, more shares and, and the people who didn't do anything they get diluted basically we see all every time what's in the treasury there is no person who is the, like the accounting person who we have to trust that takes well care of our finances etc we can every, everyone can see that then on each investment we are voting on chain with the number of shares we have in the in the thing we then have the same amount of vote in the investment if then there are investment decisions that we are we find it's like very bad and like I'm not really interested in taking part of this anymore. We could at any time a rage quit, which means that we can then sort of at the same time get out what we actually are entitled to in the investment fund and say, okay, this decision is too bad. I want to get out now. That's something typically that, that maybe you don't have the inside or ability to do in, in traditional investment funds. So the liquidity is instant if you want, and you're very involved, let's say, in the, the day to day running of the fund. Like you find investments. You do DD, you do a lot of these things, and all of that is is visible. And for all of that, you get, let's say, activity points. So you're very active, and that means that you get more shares over time of the fund, of, of the investment club. And people that are, are are no longer active or not active basically slowly get diluted. And so it's a constantly evolving, almost, organism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And in turn, then many of the other members, they are sort of representing more traditional VC funds. So it also serves sure, sure sort of as a a network between those members where they can actually then get a new deal lead, they can get that in, and then based on, on the interest, and if it happens, then, you know, they also get rewarded extra for that. So that, that's just like, maybe it's not that interesting for this part, but it's just like a, a, an example of how, you know, the VC model term is being uh, reinvented. Uh, but and there are funding-wise many types of like these new uh, tools. Uh, another bow I mean is, is uh, taking... You, you may say the complete opposite approach. This is a, a charity and a sort of a association. Uh, and uh, it's called the Common Stack, which, uh, which uh, funds uh, public good infrastructure in this space. And there we also apply sort of the same. Of course, it, it, it's, we, have, we can always choose our own governance. How should we, what type of voting do we want, et cetera, et cetera. And there we apply that just for another sort of case and, and another group of people. Uh, so this is just to show that this is how organizations can operate uh, very efficiently. Uh, there are some DAOs which go the route where it's sort of it's not really having a legal entity or what we call a legal wrapper, and it's not uh, it's not you know sort of compliant with general sort of depends on again the jurisdiction etc. And then uh, these two examples I mentioned, they are sort of they are actually just regular entities. They just use these tools. So they're fully legal. They use these tools just for anybody that's saying, yeah, but what about it? They're fully legal entities and they use the virtual tools, let's say, to operate and to make, in this case, investment decisions or charity decisions. I think it's fascinating as well. You basically, you bring in charities and you operate a much more efficient. I mean, we all know the issues with the charity industry and the way of decision making there from an office far away. We know what's good for you in a small village somewhere. I mean, the typical model and in this case it's fully decentralized and it's fully accessible and open as well like anybody in there can see exactly what's been happening with every single euro currency or whatever has been used which is in itself the transparency is already revolutionary for many ways 
Yeah, and, and you see, of course, charities are embracing Facebook, etc., like like rapidly, right? And that that has already like imagine how many like local groups, grassroots groups, or etc., like local farming groups have set up Facebook groups. Well, this is sort of just like a Facebook group, and the regulators seriously don't care if you use Facebook or not, right? For your communication or density. What they do care about is like depending where you are, for example, in, in Switzerland where I live, well, uh, the tax authorities want to see like an invoice per transaction outgoing, if it's like above a certain amount, probably KYC, so you know who you're dealing with. And then uh, we need evaluation to Switzer France so we can assess the tax impact as well. And if there's any, if it's like within Switzerland, VAT. So as long as you, you can't give them that, you can you can utilize the power tools, which suddenly and, and of okay, of course, that depends from charity to charity, organization to organization. But from from sort of my small experience in that world, not that many uh, enable you know their members to real time vote, and this gets executed like every week if you want to you know actually support this project or not, and have these other incentives that sort of makes makes this organization uh, larger than just like top management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so uh, so so yeah, I, I think that's where this offers a very interesting tool, and and I think most organizations. Uh, in the world, uh, within some years, are, are going to be operating like this more or less because uh, it is just very, very uh, efficient uh, and can scale like a lot um, soon. Uh, and it's, it's especially when you, uh, and that's what I'm sort of most engaged in, in these where it's actually operating from an entity. So you don't sort of get into any hiccups afterwards. Yeah, uh, because that we've seen examples obviously there where. I mean, you need to, as you said, if you want to operate in that way, you need to have somewhere a connection to a physical country. You need to have a good grip on taxes. You need to have a good grip on invoices. You need to have a good grip on, you know, your customer. And of course, what, because you are dealing with financial assets, which depending on where you are, are heavily regulated or less heavily regulated. But there are definitely ways, I think that's the lesson here to do it fully transparent and fully legal at the same time, which I think five years ago were impossible because many governments weren't up to speed with many things. And I'm not saying everywhere it is the case, but you can find places where if you want to, you can do this fully in the, let's say the daylight. Yeah, fully. And yeah, and then what I think it can offer is like different funding aspects and different coordination aspects. It's not just like a board meeting one time a year or a newsletter that is sent out to the members of like a charity, for example, or a cooperative, etc. No, you can actually let people have a say in like decision as they want. You can have specific like sub work groups, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, it's not like, you know, we have not learned something in terms of organizations throughout like human history, right? There are often reasons why organizations are structured as they are. That's often a mistake in this space, I think, that we try to you know, reinvent everything and, and many things in like social constructions. At the same time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But still, I think it's very appealing to, you know, enable your, your members or, or in a cooperative, for example, to be very active and to have full insights in the report. Because it also means that now people bring new insights when they actually can see in real time what the treasury is or how much it's costing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's what I'm seeing sometimes is that then that, that gives an enough sort of enormous involvement because it motivates people a lot as well. Right? And you can also put incentives so that if they then are adding extra value and the other members assess that, you choose what type of incentive or tool do I want to use to do that. The same with voting, like what type of voting do you want? Is it one vote per person? Is it like more some so like we delegate? Is it more like kind of liquid democracy? Are we more sort of in conviction voting where I sort of believe so much in something that I sort of stake on it myself? So we have all these different versions and obviously for all types of organizations, uh, there might be, you know, different combinations of such that, that make sense for, for that organization. Yeah, I remember this is quite a few years ago. I'll put a link in the show notes as well. But a Brazilian company called Semco that went fully transparent. So everybody in their organization, this is a large company building factories, mostly like cookie factories and things like that. And then distributed into many other things very organically because they took that approach of behaving like an organism. And this was without the blockchain. I'm pretty sure it would have been built on the blockchain if, if Ricardo started it now, but it was fully transparent. Like everybody to down to the cleaning woman or man knew, could look into the books, but was actually trained to actually read them as well, because otherwise it's, it's very easy to say, all oh, the books are here, go and have a look. But if you're not trained in accountancy, you have no clue what to look for. And that unleashed an enormous amount of creativity. Most people were in their, uh, in their different teams also responsible for their own salaries and were fully transparent on that as well, which unleashed an enormous amount of transparency and innovation there as well. Many people left the company, sort of founded another piece, but then within the same group 
many people, whenever there was another crisis in Brazil, managed to find enormous savings everywhere because they knew exactly what everybody else was working on and what they were working on and where the money went to. Nobody ever, when traveling, this is one of those funny examples, they didn't need to ask for a corporate credit card. They didn't need to ask for a certain permission. They were completely free to spend whatever they wanted because they were trusted that if they were going anywhere on an overseas trip, that they were able to to understand what was fair if they had to buy a first class ticket or not, what kind of hotel, what kind of meal. I mean, there were no protocols for that because they were trusted in actually being a human being and knowing that if they would spend money of the company, that was fine, but they were partly spending their own money. Of course, they didn't take it to the next level of ownership as well, but people really felt ownership or few ownership. And this company has survived ups and downs, enormous growth for, I think, plus 20 plus years in a very, let's say, quote unquote, different way. But everybody found, I mean, unleashed an innovation it wasn't for everybody, let's be clear, but it was for many people the best place to work and the best place to spend almost all their time. Many people overworked, even if there were no incentives, because it was their home and their family, basically. Yeah, and, and I think that, that can motivate a lot of people for, for a lot of uh, things. It's important for me to say that, of course, many organizations have things that, uh, you know, they don't like to be full in the public, and maybe rightfully so. So then... Uh, you know, for, for this stuff to really go like mainstream, of course, some organizations will, will not put everything on the table. Uh, and there are also privacy technologies to, to enable that. Um, but for, for a lot of things, you can do a lot of interesting stuff for this, especially if it's stuff like that you consider in the public domain or, or something like that, where there is maybe an interest and, and it's like adding a lot of value for us as a species that those things are, are, are open. Uh, again, I can just talk about the interbank market, right? You know, we, we have very little insight into when there are systemic, you know, systemic risk and crashes that would actually impact, you know, all of us, you know, if there's another 2008 crisis again, imagine how much that's going to impact the, you know, how much money is going into impact investment, right? A lot. So, so there are things there where we actually maybe have a right to have public insight into what's going on there, because that's going to avoid a lot of stuff. Uh, but, and, 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 but, and, and, but the other side, of course, the things that, depending on the company type or organization type that, you know, you don't really want to be out in the public for business purposes or for like privacy data purposes. So, so I'm not saying like everything should be an open transparent as well, but having some of these things out there transparent can, can really add a lot uh, for, for the, for the earth as, as a whole or for, as you talk about employees and, and being more involved and engaged and, and, and driving innovation and, and, you know, results from that. And, so I have so many questions, but we're not going to get to all of them. We're only going to scratch the surface, which is fine. We'll repeat this at some point. But I know you have some interesting thoughts, like um, what this could mean for the podcast or our audience. Like I always ask that question of what would you do with a 1 billion investment fund tomorrow morning or now, but like, this is instant. So we have to say now, how would you, not necessarily, how would you, you put that to work, but how would you structure that? What is the mental framework you would apply to this for people just to to see the possibilities of what is already possible now or very, very near future, like where everything goes at a breathtaking speed at the moment. So what would you do if you would be an investor with a billion dollars or whatever currency you want, but let's say a lot of money to put into making this planet a livable planet again? Yeah, so uh, I try to be very honest to you, Con, that I, I'm not really an expert in retail selling culture, et cetera. So that's sort of my starting point. Me neither, but yeah. I have followed the <laughs> podcast. I know a few projects, et cetera, et cetera. But that would be my starting point to say, because actually you don't know so much about this stuff here. But I do trust that, let's say, if we would look at and we could maybe see, okay, this person and verify that this person, because you have also like podcast platforms that are on blockchain now, and where you can see that, you know, it's the same wallet address showing that it's the same kind of person that have listened to similar podcasts 20 times. Then I would say, okay, so everyone who listens to a podcast, at least like 20 podcasts of yours, plus perhaps all the guests that are sort of experts, they would be my signal for sort of the collaborative funding process. Okay. So you would look at like, like a group of, we can verify that they, let's say no more than, than the average or more than you, but we can have an estimated guess. Like we're not sure, sure, obviously if they're good investors, but at least it's a signal that they know quite a bit about the space because we've interviewed them or, and, or they may, it might be the same person, but they listen to quite a few episodes all the way through, not just the first five minutes. Yeah. And then what sort of, is working very well in the Ethereum ecosystem is a platform called the uh, Gitcoin, and that's using what's called quadratic funding. So that would, that basically means that I have sometimes donated money, I sometimes uh, received a bit of money where 
I would say, all right, with this money, I would say maybe, okay, let's do this the next 10 years, every quarter. I am going to allocate uh, the according percentage of that money as matching funding. And this is using this principle of quadratic funding. Quadratic funding. I'm going to put it in the notes. Uh, people, don't worry. There, there will be a lot of notes after this interview. So we'll say, okay, we're going to do something every quarter for the next 10 years because we feel it's the next 10 years are going to be crucial. And you're going to match things. Yeah, because, you know, this is kind of, uh, which is sometimes okay as well. But I would sort of, you know, sometimes there's this problem that, you know, I would just tell you, ah, you should donate to this project. But I'm not really donating myself. So why do I think you should donate to it if I'm not up for, for doing it myself? And this is sort of this, this basic idea of skin in the game. So then this mm -hmm. matching would sort of look like, and that depends on the matching algorithm, which is something that, you know, Bitcoin had done this for a long time. And it's uh, like the last couple of years. And, and it's... Uh, evolving all the time too. Uh, but basically, you would say something along the lines as, okay, so if there is this uh, this farm in, in Berlin, right, nearby Berlin that is doing regenerative agriculture, they put up a, like a grant where they describe in a public page, page what, what, what are they seeking? What kind of funding are they seeking? And what are kind of their projects and deliverables? Um, they're kind of free to do that. Uh, in other implementations, it's more like standardized, so it's easier maybe to, to look at. So that looks a bit like a normal crowdfunding sort of uh, site, right? But then you can you can you can then tell uh, well if someone and then that depends on the matching algorithm. If it's like a hundred unique people that we can sort of verify are unique and maybe also rank them depend, depending on sort of the expert level, if they put their own money into this project, that probably gives some signal that this is better than you know the the scam project Gus just put up and he doesn't know anything about region uh, funding, right? So if for each of these people, in this case, if they put in $10 each, then I will match it with $50 each for, of those people who put in their own money. And we can verify that they are sort of, you know, individuals and they are knowledgeable about this space based on some criteria. We cannot never fully, that's always like a thing, we can never fully make that perfect. That's like another big problem in IT, how to fully like uh, show that you're fully unique, et cetera, et cetera. But it works fairly well. And then based on that, I'm actually not making that decision. I'm just trying to, let my funding be allocated based on, on that uh, signal of sort of people who know more about it than me and who put their own money as well. And that's sort of just to, to uh, avoid any sort of obvious spam issues, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so I think that's, that's basically how I would go about it, I think. And I would, uh, within, the, within the, the field I would, I would fund, I would then try to, you know, grade and adjust uh, this matching algorithm, et cetera, et cetera, based on, you know, the specific uh, topic and what makes sense there. And obviously, I mean, you mentioned the grant, but this could be an investment as well. And I think the underlying, the key point here is you're very clearly saying, and I think that some, many people should say that more often, like I'm not an expert, but let's find a way to tap into sort of the general knowledge or the distributed knowledge that is in the space. And there are many ways to do that. And one of them you mentioned is to see like public experts or that have clearly shown that they are learning a lot about it because they are listening to certain things or they're reading, et cetera, et cetera. You can verify that in different ways. And that's not enough because it's nice if they say, if they point to this farm in Berlin or close to Berlin saying, oh, that's very interesting. But if they don't put any money on the line, yeah, there's no skin in the game. So if that's, there are many different ways to do this, but in this case, if they put in X, then you can match it with Y. And if enough of them do it, it actually probably has a strong signal that it's not spam. Like you avoid a lot of the downfalls of uh, a lot of crowdfunding campaigns that don't go anywhere because it's completely invisible. Like who's behind it, who's actually putting money in, who's an expert that knows slightly more about this, et cetera, et cetera. And this is very scalable. I mean, you can repeat it every quarter until let's say the money runs out or money starts coming back to do mm -hmm. that. And this is how many, many projects at the moment in the blockchain world work, right? Yeah. I mean, this niche is particularly suitable for projects which don't have like when we talk about the grant domain, of course, we can talk about the business too, but the grant domain, projects that don't have like any clear monetization or ideas for making their own token, because of course, the other aspect there is, is uh, which I would probably also uh, allocate a part of, if we say $1 billion for, would be projects which I see can be enablers of many other projects, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's look at, the, I know you had the, you know, region network example in here, right? Christian, yeah. They are sort of launching their own token to launch their own network. And right now, it looks like they're quite successful on doing that. And they are doing that with a specific purpose. They're on Cosmo, right? They're on a, a specific blockchain. Yeah, Yeah. so they're, they're using what's called uh, Tendermint, which is like a, a framework to set up blockchains. And then okay. that, that's sort of developed by the guys that also are running what's called Cosmos. 
And Cosmos is a way to connect different blockchains. So if you if you do what they're doing, it's sort of you get up, getting sort of a, a, a quite efficient blockchain that you can set up without having to develop everything yourself. Plus, okay. then following this Cosmos protocol, you can then sort of be interoperable with other blockchains. And that's sort of what's happening in this space too. Is when, as you can imagine, first all these blockchains happen, people make other blockchains. Now some blockchains are better or are geared towards uh, other things than others. And sometimes it makes sense that that blockchain, you know, which is in their example, uh, sort of optimized for like X system restoration and like uh, attestation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, you know, that's maybe connected with another blockchain that have another purpose. Uh, so, so that's what they're doing. In, but in their case, what I would mean with, with like my, my sort of enabler statement would be, well, uh, they are also going to fund a lot of projects. Now they, they're going to success in this space. So sometimes that you really have sort of a multiplicator effect there by enabling those projects as well, which are also going to, you know, launch their own tokens, et cetera, et cetera. And these tokens can have very, very different primitives. And then we got sort of in, in the, what's called kind of token engineering commons direction, which is also like a big community that works on how to design such tokens with incentives or, uh, you know, you know, again, what 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 you want to do, uh, but but that's in, in that case you can you can sort of design specific issuance curves or exchange curves, or you can do such as every time this currency is exchanged, you know, ten uh, percent of the fees are donated to you know this restoration uh, project, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, just as we have like tokens, uh, it's just like very very sort of generic, you know. Uh, it can mean a lot of things. Uh, so that's a, like a big topic we can go into, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> Maybe for the next time, but I think it's fascinating to just point out that this space is attracting a lot of people, a lot of very, very smart people. And in general, again, that's a signaling function. Like if you see very, very smart people moving into a space that I see actually in the regeneration space as well from other sectors that leave very good jobs behind or very nice careers, etc. It means something is happening, even though I don't fully understand it. Maybe nobody does, but you see like it's a signaling function if people, they have skin in the game because they gave up something else. And when you look at something like Regen Network, I remember interviewing them and struggling because I don't really grasp what to even ask. Like what are metrics? What is a mental framework we listeners to this podcast should use when we're asking questions to these kind of coins, tokens, blockchains that claim everything about regeneration that we possibly want? But of course, there's a lot of noise out there. I'm not saying that region network is noise, but I, I really struggle with what questions to come up with because in, let's say, quote unquote, normal companies, I can do that. But in this case, it's really different. Yeah. So how, how I view it is a bit the same as investing sort of in different organizations or giving like different group of people in organizations like money or investing into them. There are different stages. And at this different stages, let's say it's just like very conservative, a VC, okay, and maybe there's like pre-product stuff like that, very risky early stage. Then there is a product. And then there, if you are sort of a more short-sighted investor, you're very looking into like what is the revenue, stuff like that. And then later on, you're looking at like other things, like depending on like maybe now after two years when you have done an A and B round, you want to have, you want to look for like now, great, you have all this, all these users, you have all the turnaround. Now we, we want you to see a lot of profit, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, I think... How I think about these kind of blockchain startups is it's kind of a bit the same, that you kind of look at different things at different stages, uh, naturally speaking, right? So when we are pre products, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and like a very early stage, let's say some of the checks we maybe give for like pre-seed money, you know, maybe they raise $100,000, you know, with a quite low valuation or something like that, just to get that started, you know. At that, at that time, well, I think me personally, it's so much about the, the people, the team, do you believe in it? Everything they say basically is some kind of vision and that vision can be credible. And it's a story they're telling, like, you know, how most things in society works are just stories or narrative we tell. But if they can somehow convince you that that story and vision that they will do and it kind of sound plan and it, it makes sense, maybe from take off your point of view, maybe you start to give them money because you have that feeling based on those metrics. But that's sort of more, uh, when you are like that early, like kind of, pre-seed, pre uh, angel, I, I think it's fair to say there's a lot of gut feeling, intuition on that, and that's about chemistry with founders, and, and some people you can just, you just don't believe that, you know, what they are saying is possible, or, or that they are the right to, might want to do it, and some people just do. So at that stage, I think that's sort of uh, both for traditional companies and startup, startup uh, in the blockchain space, what you're looking for. Then at the later stage as an investor, well, 
if I would look, let's say, I'm just going to like a, a contrast now to the full other aspect and look at blockchains today. If I want to compare, let's say, Ethereum with like 10 layer, like 10, uh, 30 generation blockchains, for example, right? Now I'm sort of going in a systems that are already live and they are in this in this kind of scenario. It's a contrast tool because it's typically not a typical startup that runs these blockchains because of this big network. But then just as you have sort of an annual report to look at for a company, you have also quantitative metrics you can look at for blockchains. So you can look at like how many users do you have, how many active daily users. That's the same as, you know, if you wanted to invest in Snapchat some years ago before they had any uh, you know, revenue. That's how you look at these kind of software startup too. Then what you can look at is also like how much gas is actually paid in fees and, and of course the, the percentage of growth in, in this and the user numbers. So gas fees is basically the cost that you were mentioning before, like to do something on the blockchain is called gas fees. And in Ethereum, that's been exploding. And of course, that's a risk. If you want to do a lot of small transactions, you're not going to pay a huge transaction fee or infrastructure fee. But if you are running something like Ethereum and you actually are accumulating like a lot of millions of dollars in transaction fees from like millions of users, that also shows a bit like very new from a startup. That shows like, okay, you're on track on something, right? Because you are providing a service that people want to pay actually a lot for. So that's like a quantitative metric too. People are valuing it enough to pay the gas fees, yeah. And in this example, I'm talking about blockchain. So that you could talk about like traditional annual report metrics for companies. And then this is more kind of network metric, you could say. And then you would also look at, you know, the number of startups, how much have they raised, what are they doing, how many users do they have, what's built on top of this? Because with blockchain, that's sort of just infrastructure. And it's only as good as, especially the ones which are more generalized computers, what's built on top of it, you know? Is it the new Airbnb that is built on this blockchain and they have a billion users? Well, it, then it's probably worth something, right? If they are sort of built on this infrastructure and maybe there's, you know, also the next Amazon, maybe there's also the next, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, that's definitely something that's interesting too. And then uh, in these protocols uh, that are, and now I say protocols, but that's kind of like apps on top of these blockchains, if that's, for example, a decentralized exchange where you can swap your tokens and uh, there is a specific volume on that or there is so much, uh, you know, we have the measure called TVL, stands for total value locked. And this is when you lock up specific things, uh, assets in a blockchain, maybe for specific purpose, like a return or something else, then uh, that also shows that people have locked so much up on an app uh, in, on top of this uh, blockchain. So that's sort of the... What you can look at if you are sort of more investing into the or looking at the like larger blockchains. Mm. Then there are all the steps in between where you are early stage product, et cetera, et cetera. And I would just, my understanding is just like going from very like trust, intuition, or like chemistry in the team based. And of course, if the team had sold the startup before, that's always like a super good thing. Or if they get a, you know, it's the best friend from, from the startup you already invested into and it's very successful, that's. So it's the same kind of thing with the normal business. And then mm -hmm. you have these different steps on the way where typically as an investor in this space, well, if there is equity, you want equity. But if there's tokens, you want that kind of more. So you want it both. If there's both equity and token, if it's a token launched from, you know, a nonprofit organization, it's fine. You just get tokens. Uh, but then it depends a bit on like the tokenomics. Does this token actually add something to this product? Or is it just like something that is like, you know, uh, squeezed in there? To, to like make uh, a lot of money very fast. If if it makes the product worse, I would say it's kind of bad token. If the, if it makes the product or sort of you know whatever that startup is doing uh, uh, better and it's like an in, like a fundamental thing for making that thing work, then I think it's very interesting. And then if it can somehow accrue value or there's some element to it, uh, then well uh, that's then we are sort of in the what's called tokenomics aspect, and and then that's very interesting too. Um, but of course, it's just one element. Like next to you know what every startup organization have in terms of like go to market, getting users, customers, you know partnerships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, so very similar in many aspects to what investors might be already used to. I want to be conscious of your time and ask a final question. What would you do if you so you no longer have the distributed fund that we talked about before? But what would you do with a magic wand if you could change one thing? But it could be anything; it doesn't have to be blockchain or regen ag or regeneration related, but you had the power to change one thing overnight, what would you do? One thing overnight? Well, I think what is needed and what, what Bella taught me is that this is mostly about what's in the head of all us people. You know, We have actually paradise on Earth. We have the flourishing path here on Earth. So it's more like a thought revolution and working together and collaborating on solving uh, those basic you know, 
problems and, and serving those basic needs, we all have, and I'm talking about like humans here and making sure that with that realization, we are not destroying the planet, we're not destroying ourselves, animals, other uh, life beings. So I think like having that awakening and thought revolution and empathy would be the single biggest thing. And I think that would actually solve a lot of problems. I want to thank you so much, Gustav, for giving us an insight into the fascinating world of blockchain and everything crypto. And probably not the last time there is so much happening in that space and obviously in all the spaces that uh, surround it. And I think we're going to see a lot of much more practical applications of these models over the next year slash years. And we'll be coming back to explain them to us and to see what to, how we should put these very, very powerful, uh, let's not underestimate this at all, very powerful tools to work. Sure, yeah, thanks a lot. Very happy to be here, share my knowledge, happy to get in touch, uh, answer further questions, and also want to thank you, Cohen, for your great work on summoning leading experts in this field around the world and pollinating here, because I think that that's really leading to a lot of great collaboration, and that's a huge impact that maybe can be hard to see just from day to day, but I think that's really leading to a lot of very interesting development. So thank you, too, for that. Thank you so much for those nice words, and have a great day. Yeah, bye bye. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash investingregionag or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in the space. The soil builders, people working in the space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations um, institutional capital banks insurance companies etc is this course free no this is pay what you think it's worth meaning i have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you and i'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast um, we have people with very different means so i'm inviting you if this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.